I'm Heidi Hutner, host of Coffee with H Times 2. Today on our show, I'm thrilled to have Kristen Iverson, author of the book Full Body Burden. In this book, Kristen talks about growing up next to a nuclear weapons plant um, where they are, they are building, working with um, plutonium. And Kristen will be talking today to us about that book and about her other writing. She's a phenomenal writer. Hi, Kristen. Great to see you. Hi, Heidi. It's great to be here. Thank you. So, so thrilled to have you on. Um, could you tell us about your journey into writing Full Body Burden? What led you to write it? How you got there? Well, uh, the book is essentially the story of the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant, which had been a part of my life, a part of my childhood, all my growing up years. And we never really knew what they did at the plant. Our home was just three miles from the plant, and it was uh, really the biggest secret, not only in the neighborhood, but the biggest secret in Colorado. Uh, when I was a kid, the plant was operated by Dow Chemical, and uh, the rumor in the neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. For years, my mother thought they were making scrubbing bubbles, <laughs> but they were not making scrubbing bubbles. Um, Rocky Flats, uh, from 1952 until 1989, uh, produced plutonium pits or triggers for nuclear weapons, essentially the heart of every nuclear weapon in America. Over the course of that uh, period of almost 40 years, Rocky Flats produced more than 70,000 uh, pits or triggers, each one the size, kind of the size of a small, slightly flattened grapefruit, and each pit uh, contains enough breathable car particles of plutonium to kill every person on Earth. It's highly, highly dangerous material, obviously, um, and there was extensive uh, radioactive and toxic contamination in the air, in the water, in the soil. We had no idea. I grew up next to the plant. Um, my sisters and my brother and I rode our horses in the fields around the plant. We swam in the lake. Uh, and we really had no idea what was going on. And then later, like a lot of the kids in my neighborhood, I went to, ro went to work at Rocky Flats myself. So the book is a, it's a blend of investigative journalism, uh, very heavily researched, 10 years of research went into the writing of this book. And then it's also the story of my personal my story and the story of my family and uh, my neighbors and co-workers and uh, really telling the story of Rocky Flats through the eyes of the people who lived it um, as well as the actual history of the plant itself. So you, I know that you swam in those waters, you ate food that was grown nearby, there's some descriptions in your book about animals that had, you know, birth defects and strange growths and yet you were fed those turkeys. I remember reading that in your book. Um, what was that like? Well, it's interesting that you bring up the animals because it's, it's in the animals that we first begin to see some of the hard evidence of the contamination that was happening. Uh, the Jackson Turkey Farm was indeed um, just down the road from our house, uh, pretty much just uh, across the street and down the road a little bit from the Rocky Flats plant itself. Um, and uh, we uh, went to school with all of the boys who lived on that farm. There were four brothers. And they uh, talked about how the Department of Energy, um, later they talked about how the Department of Energy conducted um, raids on the turkey farm to test the turkeys. Uh, and they were never told the results of that, uh, of those tests. And, and of course, we weren't either. We didn't even know that was going on. Um, but the turkeys were contaminated. We ate those turkeys. Uh, the, we see radioactive and toxic contamination in other animals in the area. Strontium was found in the bones of horses right in our neighborhood. Um, radiation has been detected uh, in rabbits, in dogs, for example. There's a high rate of cancer in dogs, um, particularly in the paws of the feet from um, exposure to the soil. So it's, we begin to see some of these things in the animals, and then, of course, it's impacting the people as well. So shocking. And today, what's happening in Rocky Flats? Well, this uh, story of Rocky Flats has never ended. Uh, the Cold War continues, I guess you could say, in our own backyard in Colorado. Um, the site has been closed. It was a very controversial cleanup, uh, some would say, certainly many of the workers and some of the scientists and physicists involved with this would, would say that it's more of a, a cover-up rather than a cleanup. 
um, there are very high levels of contamination left on site. It is a 6,000 acre site. 1,300 acres are so profoundly contaminated with plutonium and so much material is still buried out there that that 1,300 acres can never open to the public. It will always be dangerous. Plutonium has a half-life of uh, 24,100 years. Mm. Um, there is contamination throughout the site, but a lot of um, push on the part of the Department of Energy, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which now manages part of the site, and uh, also local politicians and some local developers and home builders who would like to see that site, which is technically a national wildlife refuge. Um, but one of the things that I think most people don't realize is that when a site is classified um, as a wildlife refuge in the manner in which Rocky Flats has been classified, it allows a great deal of contamination to remain on site. Um, so it's so the site is risky for a number of reasons. Uh, and there is a push to open the site for public hiking, biking, recreation. Uh, and then also we have home building happening uh, directly adjacent to that site. And there is no legal requirement for developers um, to inform potential home buyers that there is uh, potential danger of risk associated with this land and there is no legal requirement for them to reveal what happened uh, at Rocky Flats and the fact that it continues to be a uh, very controversial site. So there are children playing in backyards with plutonium in the soil? Yes. Um, I think that uh, um, one way to think about it is that with respect to the site itself, the standards that were established, well, let me back up a little bit and say, when I worked at Rocky Flats, uh, the Department of Energy um, predicted that it would take billions and billions of dollars and more than 70 years to achieve any sort of adequate cleanup or anything close to background standard. And um, they felt that it really was an impossible task, that we did not they did not have the capacity, the technical capacity to clean it up like that. And of course, that's extremely expensive. What we ended up with was a much shorter uh, cleanup period, uh, about six years and about $6 billion. And um, what that left us with is essentially three layers of contamination. The top uh, three feet of soil um, is cleaned up to 50 picocuries per gram of soil. From three to six feet, we allow 1,000 to 6,000 picocuries per gram of soil. Below six feet, there is no limit. And when you think about the more than 800 buildings that were out at that site, most many of them underground, the fact that material was moved uh, in piping between these buildings transported in that way and that much of this material was left on site. Um, there are still two major uh, areas that contain plutonium and other radioactive and toxic material on site um, and, they're, and they're currently capped which is also problematic. Um, so what we have is a very very compromised cleanup and um, in my opinion, and certainly in the opinion of many others, that site should never be opened for hiking or biking or any kind of public recreation. And if someone chooses to buy a house near that area, they certainly should be informed of the potential risk. And, and the reason, one reason why I mention these layers, uh, and also uh, plutonium can collect in hot spots in the soil. When you have children playing in the soil, they can, um, you know, possibly ingest a particle of plutonium into their lungs, or perhaps a uh, scrape on a knee or something like that. Oh, wow. So, so where is Rocky Flats for our listeners? Now, everyone may not know where it is. Well, Rocky Flats is located just outside of Boulder. Um, the town that I grew up in is called Arvada, and it's about nine miles uh, south of Boulder and about 11 miles from Denver. So it's a beautiful area. It's a highly desirable place to live uh, because it is so close to Boulder and Denver. And, and it's beautiful. Uh, the mountains are right there. It's high plateau. It's really beautiful land. It's, it's very sad that, uh, that we have poisoned in the way that we have. 
So you describe in the book two, I believe, two fires. Is, am, am I right about that? That's correct. And were there plumes from those fires that went over Denver, where there's, it's a highly populated area? If I recall correctly, that, that's what you wrote in your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Actually, um, over the course of um, its years of operation, there were more than 200 fires at Rocky Flats. There was also an incinerator uh, that burned plutonium contaminated material on a daily basis, sometimes around the clock. So that material was uh, getting into the atmosphere and moving over the Metro Denver area on a fairly regular basis. But the two big fires that I talk about in my book, there was one in 1957 that happened before I was born, a very serious fire. Uh, it burned out, not only did it burn through the entire plutonium processing building, but it burned through the, um, through the filters. And so we'll never know exactly how much material escaped um, over you know, Arvada in particular, which is where my house uh, was, but on over the Metro Denver area. And that was a large plume. It went all the way to the border. Um, to, and, uh, you know, plutonium doesn't stop at the state border. In fact, there's evidence that it went even beyond state lines. But within um, two years after that particular fire, we saw a spike in uh, childhood leukemia uh, in a number of health issues that can be tied directly to that fire. The second big fire was in 1969 on Mother's Day, May 11th, 1969. Uh, I was a kid, um, I was out with my family, we were having Mother's Day brunch. Uh, we had no idea that there was a fire uh, at the plutonium facility at the core of the plant there. There was no evacuation, there was no warning, there was no information available to residents when the fire happened or even after the fire happened. It wasn't until the DOE was forced to admit that this fire had occurred that they did. Um, that created a similar plume and uh, we have maps that show exactly where that plume went and how much radiation uh, and material it carried with it. And it moved over the Arvada, particularly Arvada, Westminster area, south and east of the plant and then on over the Metro Denver area. And so again, we see uh, a lot of health health effects from this. I'm sure it sounds just. And you know what's so extraordinary is how few people know about it, and how few people know about the test bombs, for instance, in Nevada. You know the hundreds of test bombs. But this is a story that, until your book came out, I don't think anyone was talking about it. So, people call it a you know a secret war on the American people. You know, meanwhile we're building bombs to protect ourselves supposedly, to protect ourselves from enemies, but we're harming our own people. We're harming the earth, right? We're harming human beings and animals and our future and future generations. Mm -hmm. How do you warn people 24,000 years from now that a site is polluted um, in, in such a profound way? Um, what was your reaction to Fukushima, for instance, the meltdown in 311-11? Well, it, it was very interesting to me in the sense that the reaction of TEPCO and the reaction of the government was very similar to what we've seen at Rocky Flats and also at other uh, similar sites, Chernobyl for example, which is a, a denial, um, lack of information, and, and I think um, that continues to the present day certainly to a certain extent. And uh, it makes it very difficult for people who live in the area and are most immediately affected by these things to find out any uh, firm information. Um, about what has actually happened and then what the uh, short and long-term effects are to that. And, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just add something in with respect to Rocky Flats that happened fairly recently. Uh, about two years ago, we had flooding in Colorado and the entire Rocky Flats site and the core area that I mentioned earlier that is so profoundly contaminated was underwater and I'm talking three to six feet of fast moving water that oh. moved that site and um, moved into local neighborhoods, you know. Uh, there was what we call sediment transfer. The water picked up a lot of soil, some of that soil is contaminated, and um, moved that into local neighborhoods. And then of course when the water evaporates, you have the risk of what's in the water. And then when the water evaporates, then you, those particles are available for resuspension in the air. So there were a lot of people living nearby, uh, living near Rocky Flats, who were very concerned 
about material that was coming off site. And it was months and months before we found out anything. And then it was only partial information. And the information was not complete. Uh, out of the six monitoring stations, two of the monitoring stations were knocked out by the floods for several hours. Uh, one of the caps that I mentioned earlier actually cracked. And there was uh, some material coming from that as well. And it was almost a year before residents had any information at all. And, um, and even then, it was only partial information. That's so scary. You know, all of, I know you have children. I have a child. And, you know, obviously so many families in America. And to think that we don't know when a site is contaminated, right? How do we make that choice? I don't want to go there. I do want to go there. I will buy a house. I'm willing to take the risk. I mean, obviously, no one should take the risk to have mm -hmm. a home where there's plutonium in the soil. But at least we want to know, right? That sort of, we deserve yeah. to have this information. It's shocking to think that people don't know and that they're going to build this park mm -hmm. in this single location seems outrageous to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting when I was doing my research, there was a plant in um, Russia called Mayak. And what they were doing at Mayak was basically the same as what we were doing at Rocky Flats. Uh, they were producing plutonium pitcher triggers for weapons. There was extensive contamination. What's interesting is that the fires and the accidents and the problems at Mayak happened at almost exactly the same rate and at the same time as, as what was happening at Rocky Flats. The curious thing to me, uh, and I would say this may be true to a certain extent even to the present day, is that people living around Mayak knew more about what was happening there than mm. what people in Colorado knew about Rocky Flats. And I think um, in a democracy where we certainly strive for some um, degree of transparency uh, with these things, uh, it's, it's stunning that we didn't know. I think it's stunning how much we, we don't know now. And it really is, um, it's on our shoulders to try to figure out exactly how how dangerous these sites are. Um, and there is a big profit motive in all of this, not just with respect to producing nuclear weapons and all of the, uh, everything that goes on around that. But as I mentioned earlier, the real estate interest in this area, it's a very desirable area. There are a lot of people moving in from out of state. Uh, they're buying these houses out there at a good price. And uh, ironically, some of those houses are green houses. Yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, it's just, um, it's really a uh, tragedy that, um, that this is happening. Because of course we know that radiation doesn't just impact one generation, it, it's, it genetically gets passed on. You, can, you might not see it in one generation, you can see, can, you know, can see cancer in many generations going forward. Um, mm -hmm. So to close, I just wanted to ask about the health of your family and also you mentioned the health of friends locally, children growing up. What, what happened in the area in terms of seeing the cancer cancer rates rise? Anyone you know in pers personally? Mm -hmm. That's a great question and, um, and that's why I continue to talk about Rocky Flats. Since my book came out there has been a new wave of grassroots activism and part of that is because there are so many sick people and it is continuing to the present day. Um, of course there are uh, some um, kind of immediately identifiable patterns of disease that we see, which include leukemia, lymphoma, and brain tumors in particular. Um, but then we also have, you know, radiation and plutonium causes harm to the immune system. And so we have a lot of immune deficiency issues and things like that. And in my family, we've had cancer and lots and lots of immune deficiency problems, thyroid issues and that sort of thing. And then, of course, there is the genetic damage uh, that can go on for generations. So we see all these things in the areas around Rocky Flats, um, particularly in the southern and eastern areas from the plant. And one thing that's happened is that finally uh, we have I, what, what I hope will be enough interest from local universities and medical facilities and that sort of thing to provide um, surveys and more public health monitoring for people who live around Rocky Flats. There has been some help for workers at the plant, and that's a whole another discussion here, but there has never been anything available for residents, despite the fact uh, of a huge 
class action lawsuit. More than 13,000 people involved in this lawsuit felt that their uh, health had been seriously impacted, uh, you know, by being close to the plant, and um, that was uh, lost on appeal through a technicality. Uh, those people didn't go away. Those health concerns did not go away. It's all continuing to the present day. Well, thank you so much, Christian. I could talk to you for hours, as I think you know. And you're working on a new book, As We Close. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? And then we'll have to say goodbye. I am indeed working uh, on a new book. It's a lot of fun. I'm working on uh, a book about the inventor Nikola Tesla and his uh, friendship, perhaps surprising to some people uh, to hear this, his friendship with uh, author Mark Twain. And uh, it's uh, the title of it is at this point, the title may change, but at this point it's Strange Genius, The Curious Friendship of Nikola Tesla and Mark Twain. And there are some interesting connections to um, uh, the anti-war movement and, and all sorts of things. Both of those uh, men were writers, they were both inventors, and they were also very interested in, in helping to create a peaceful world, actually. So it's wow. a lot of fun. Wow, and the, and the tradition obviously being passed down to the new Tesla vehicles, right, from, the, from, that, from their ancestor. Um, so thank you so much, Kristen, uh, for your time, for your fabulous book. I know it's being translated into many languages. It's taught at colleges all over the U.S. and around the world. I use it in my classroom many times. It's an important book, Full Body Burden. It tells a story that most Americans don't know about our nuclear weapons history and plutonium pollution, which is still a huge problem in the state of Colorado. So I recommend the book. It's a great personal story, a family story, and a tragedy of U.S. pollution. It should be taken care of. It needs to be cleaned up. Um, we need to protect our children and our future. Thank you, Kristen. And that was our episode on Coffee with H Times 2. You can see more of our shows at my website, HeidiHutner.com. Thank you. Thank you.